Welcome to APA's weekly webinar. My name is Billy Zadik, Manager of Special Projects for APA. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. The webinar recording will be posted to APA's webpage later this afternoon. You'll receive a follow-up email in the next couple of days with a link to the webpage where all webinar recordings are housed, as well as a link to our upcoming webinars. We have webinars planned out through the end of 2021, and many are open for registration. Professional Continuing Education and AIACLU credits are being offered for today's program. If you are an AIA professional requiring a certificate, please send an email to me at billie, B-I-L-L-I-E, at APA.org, along with your AIA membership number if you have not done so in the past. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Please type your questions in the chat box, and they will be answered in the order they are received. If we run out of time and we still have questions, responses will be sent directly to the person asking the question by one of our presenters. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn this over to Laura and Tom. Laura, take it away. Thank you. I would first like to thank everyone for joining Tom and myself today to learn a little bit about UMass's distribution systems and Gilslate 500XR. Gilslate has been participating and supporting APA and their various chapters for many decades. I would also like to thank APA and Billy, UMass, Amherst, Tom, as well as Mark with SPD, our Northeast representative, for their assistance and this opportunity to present to you today. I am Laura Duncan, I'm president and owner of Gilsolate, and Tom has asked that I start with just a quick overview of Gilsolate first. So for those of you who have never heard of Gilsolate, the name Gilsolate has actually been in the marketplace for nearly eight decades. It was originally invented by Chevron, the oil company, and American Gilsonite. They came up with this concept of what's called a pour-in-place insulation system. The original material was actually black, looked like this. So if you have some pipes on campus that are old from the 40s, 50s, 60s that have black material around it, could be the old gill slate material. As you can see, this is kind of a solid. That's a problem for direct buried applications. There were some shortcomings to this material. So in the 60s, they went back to the drawing board, essentially to try to create a better mousetrap. And they came up with the white material that you're seeing in the video in the right side of your screen of, of white inert inorganic minerals. The product was patented for direct buried applications for pipes and tanks with a number of attributes. One being its superior insulation properties. Two being its hydrophobic nature. So as you can see in the video, we're demonstrating it being in water. Once insulation gets wet, it's actually no longer an insulator. You're better off to have no insulation around your piping system than wet insulation. The jar to the right, we call our mini hydrostatic head of water pressure. What that means is water, like groundwater or saturated soil, pushing down on the insulation envelope. In the little glass jar, that's our mini one and a half inch hydrostatic head of water pressure. But that comes into play in your direct buried applications where you can be as, as deep as 18 feet in the ground. Another aspect that was part of the patent uh, is its load bearing properties. It handles 12,000 pounds per square foot, as well as its dielectric properties, which is going to prevent corrosion to any type of metal pipe that you might use. Our product can be used on systems 35 degrees to 800. So it's pretty much gonna cover any type of piping system that you might have on campus. And it can be used with any type of piping material. So whether it's HDPE, the new PERT pipe, aquatherm, uh, ductile iron, copper, steel, any of those piping materials, any size pipe, the Gilsolate can work with it. Now, of course, a hot topic right now with a lot of colleges and universities is carbon neutrality and reducing those energy. So having a high performance insulation is a key component to reducing your energy. And some of the slides that Tom's gonna to be sharing with you include UMass's thermal imaging of some of the systems that they had, as well as the Gilsolate systems. Also on some of the slides, you'll see some little snippets or little quotes from reports or studies done by the Army Corps of Engineers. 
the army or the military has the largest distribution network of anybody in the country. And therefore, they've done a number of studies on their systems, including wet insulation, what the impacts of that are, the effects to the efficiency, as well as costs. So you'll see some of those snippets as well um, in, in the presentation. I'm now going to turn it over to Tom to take it from here. Tom? Thanks, Laura. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Feinkevitz. I'm in the utilities division at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. As you can see, we have a fairly large, and these are actually dated. We learned every, this is from three, four years ago from, from the data. So totally we're, we're looking at about 35,000 undergraduate, graduate students at the University of Mass, Massachusetts right now. Um, we're located in a rural area of the western part of the state of Massachusetts. We started out as a, an agricultural college, uh, ag agricultural state college, and we still go back to our roots um, many times as we still have uh, the Stockbridge School um, that, that predates most of UMass as well. Um, basically what we hope to show today is one, one thing, one, one project that we started on a few years ago. Um, our university, as can be seen in the map on the right, has 183 buildings. We have approximately 26 miles of steam and condensate distribution piping, 34 mi 35 miles of water distribution. In 2019, uh, we, we sat down and tried to understand what we actually had underground and the condition of everything underground. And we felt that, as can be seen in the red lines on the chart, the red had been identified as areas that need immediate attention. The orange, yellow lines, we would need attention within the next 10 or 15 years. So as can be seen, there's, there's a, a significant portion of our distribution system that needed an upgrade. Um, our campus runs on what we call low pressure, which is 17, which is 17 pounds for most of the heating needs. We also have 87 pounds pressure that sent out in tandem with the, eight, the 17. That's what we refer to as our medium pressure that augments our research buildings, which uh, and their autoclaves and and with the other needs for uh, um, higher temperature, higher pressure uh, steam. Our latest project that we worked on is we have a large residential area that we call the Southwest Residential that was built back in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And we had not been returning condensate from that area for 30, 40 years, a long time. So what we did um, is we went down there, we um, revamped the entire uh, condensate system by increasing our pressure, we and typically gone from the 17 pounds, we were able to bump it up by a few pounds, 25 up to about 22 pounds, 23 pounds, and that gave us enough pressure to to return the condensate up over. When we did a hydrological um, study, we found that we were we didn't have enough um, pressure to get it over the hump. We're now getting it over the hump and we're returning about 250 to $300,000 worth of condensate a year that before was being flushed down in the drains. Um, so we are very energy conscious at the university and this uh, energy savings was a tremendous return to the, to the university. The, um, on our right-hand side, we show um, one of the areas that we'd like to discuss today about that we had a problem. We had a line that ran between our manhole, C manhole 40 and 58. And this line had been replaced a minimum of twice, two times in the, in the very recent past. And it had failed once again. Um, the failure we'll see um, coming up with some IR photos but we, we were 
steaming significantly coming out of both manholes on the top and the bottom, manhole 40 and manhole 58. Uh, we knew that steam, we, we actually had moisture coming out of the drains. It, it was a uh, pipe within a pipe conduit system, uh, trade name Ravanco Permapipe uh, Thermocore. Uh, and we were having water coming out. So we knew that our insulation was compromised. Uh, and we absolutely knew that we were losing a significant uh, amount of money through the loss of our energy. We, we at an IDEA conference a few years ago, we, we met with uh, a number of representatives from uh, the aforementioned companies. We also talked to uh, Gil Slate. I think that's when I first met Laura and, and, and her, her uh, associates. We met them, we talked to uh, um, a different insulation companies because we were trying to find, we were trying to find ways to go forward. If you go to the next, Laura. Yeah, yeah I'll jump and, in. So I was yeah. just going to insert here that AFRA identifies certain acceptable direct buried systems um, for piping. Uh, your choices are essentially, as, as Tom was mentioning, the pre-insulated piping systems. They come in different configurations. You have the carrier pipe with the insulation and a jacket, or you have, as Tom mentioned, the drainable dryable system, which is the carrier pipe with the insulation and annulus of airspace and uh, a casing. You've got, you can have two pipes within a single uh, casing. And then you have your concrete options, a walkable tunnel. I always like to say that the walkable tunnels are your best system out there because you can always access those pipes. Unfortunately, the cost of putting in the tunnel can be, you know, as low as 10 grand a foot. And not all universities and, and other clients have the financial resources to put that type of system in. Um, they also have another concrete type tunnel that's not walkable. You have a shallow concrete trench, and then you have your field applied systems, which would be a cellular glass, like a foam glass system, and then the pour in place system, which would be the gilsolate system. And I don't know if and, you wanted and, to add anything here, Tom. And I would, we, it was, we just had a meeting this morning where we're looking at building two new, two new facilities. And they asked, they asked, um, we, were, we, we were talking about utilities. And I had talked. They said if if they were to bring steam, what what we what would your preference be? And then I agree with Laura. We asked for a instead of a, a walk through tunnel, we'd like a tunnel that's large enough that we could have our crews drive golf carts through them, um, and so we could we could perform maintenance on them. And it's still funny what on a Zoom meeting, um, people you could still see people falling off their chair laughing. Um, and then when they got back in their seats, we started talking about what we seriously could do. And we have a combination of a lot of systems on, we have, we have stuff on the ground still that, that goes back to the 50, that would, the trade name was Rickwell. We had a, a, a lot of Rickwell systems. Uh, we had um, foam glass that had pit wrap on it. Um, that, a lot of that stuff is, is aged right now. Some of it's aged well, some of it hasn't. Since around the 1990s, we have um, installed the uh, pipe within a pipe or conduit piping uh, almost exclusively. We have a few. We we have installed a few utility doors, where basically uh, you put pipe within a, a chamber and you have a hood uh, a top so you can access it. We have not. We have done renovations on walk walkable tunnels, but we have not. We have not. Uh, installed walkable tunnels uh, on the earth because of costs in a, in a long time and and basically what we what we found is that cost cost was with the the systems that we had been using with start was really causing us not to be able to repair a lot of the areas that we needed to repair purely by cost not not because of need but by cost okay. um, so in 1967, uh, they had installed a, a system. It was a Rickwell system that had gone between manhole number 40 and number 58. It was approximately 225 feet. 
long. It serves it serves our our uh, eastern part of the campus, which is pri primarily residential. Uh, and our our university health system is over there. It's so it's a 12 inch pipe, 17 pounds pressure. And we return with a, uh, and, and we always use uh, um, uh, seamless 106 pipe uh, for, and that's scheduled 40. Our condensate is uh, you, typically nothing smaller. The smallest thing we'll put in the ground is uh, four inch. There are some two inch, but usually it's four inch with uh, schedule 80 on the condensate. Most of this stuff was uh, that was solved in the 67 version was asbestos insulation, and we had we were in the process of re trying to get rid of any of the asbestos that we do have in the ground. So that that's what happened back in 1968. 2004, we had um, they had put in a, an, another system, uh, and this was the pipe within the pipe. Uh, it was a direct buried system. It goes up a pretty significant hill. Um, and some of the areas, uh, their depth of the buried pipe is almost 20 feet down. That's next year's summer project on the, the remaining section of that. Uh, it, but it was 12, again, 12 inch standard weights, schedule 40, um, 106 seamless. We had men wool insulation, uh, and then we had an outer, like it says, an outer steel conduit of 10 gauge with a poly polyurethane wrap. Uh, and condensate was with a uh, parallel line, four inch in diameter, uh, four inch diameter pipe, schedule schedule eighty, with same with similar uh, insulation. This is a picture of what it looked like back in two thousand four uh, during the insulation the insulation at that time. You can see, uh, you we do have a very um, steep grade. This is at the lower. This isn't. This isn't where it really gets deep. This is still pretty shallow. The 225 uh, feet run. Uh, this was a system that was installed in 2004, approximately half a million dollars, five hundred thousand uh, dollars. And at that time, it was put in with a. We had a 43, 44 million dollar uh, energy conservation program on on campus that was. Uh, that Johnson Controls was running for us, and this was one of one of the areas. As you can see, the manhole on the left, uh, it was in pretty rough shape. But they basically what we did is take cut the top off, cut the top of the manhole off. They squared up all the uh, the sides and put a new cover on the top. But this is kind of what it looked um, what it looked like in 2004 when they installed it. Over the years, we have we have a, a one of the methods that we that we have on campus is we all are always looking at what we have for our, our thermal efficiency, and as can be seen on the um, pictures, we had identified some very um, serious heat loss in in our steam lines. We kind of knew that as well because we were again we were getting steam coming on our samples. And every time we would go, go, go down into our manholes on the drains and on the vents, we were getting uh, either steam and or water coming out of it, which are not, which for us are, are very concerning. This at the time, it, uh, this was found to be um, 2015. So this was approximately nine years after the installation of this uh, project. And there was a lot of, there was some huge concerns um, with the administration that we had a nine-year investment um, and it was and it was failing already. Um, some of the what we noticed, uh, A was a seam coming out of the, the manholes. We also uh, saw, found that um, our landscape service, the people maintain our, our grounds, were continually coming to us telling us all the grass was dying uh, over in that area. And we also found uh, we also do a another. We usually drive around and take photos of our system in the in the winter time, um, and we find that we have we we fortunately have snow, which is something I know that Laura in California doesn't have. But we have snow, and we get three or four inches of snow. We usually will go out in a couple of days, and 
we also can can uh, um, have, it is kind of like a proofing of our our IR flyovers because it'll melt the snow in areas of concern. But we also have an IR camera, um, so when we have identified an area that needs to replacement or need to be looked at, we will actually go out with our. Uh, this is one of our utility mechanics, Mark, who um, goes out with the IR camera, and he'll actually we can try to pinpoint where our prop where our problems were, and. Typically, we can, with, with our IR camera, we can pinpoint pretty accurately where the leaks are, or at least get us very close to the uh, area where there is a problem. We also have a, our utility department also takes um, care of uh, our water, sewer, storm water, our RO water. Uh, so we have tools that help us identify where leaks are, and one of the things that we use is we use uh, we have a ground mic that we can listen. We can listen for leaks in the steam lines, which is sometimes difficult with the with the uh, pipe within a pipe. It sometimes makes it very hard to find. But another thing that we use is that we we partnered with um, the makers of a our correlators, which are used in water distribution to help pinpoint where leaks are in the water distribution lines. And basically, we'll, we'll take the, our correlators, put them on our steam lines, and if we think we have a leak, we'll put with the correlators in place, we let them, we put them on. We know what the, um, the speed of sound is through uh, the steel that we're utilizing. And we can also find, because of the noise that's created by, and actually it works better in a steam line because of the, uh, the, uh, the expansion of the steam coming out of the leak. So we can kind of nail down exactly where the leaks are and that also with our correlators. Um, and so we'll use between the IR cameras, the ground mics and the correlators, we usually get a pretty good idea where our leaks are in the, the steam system. And so that was our goal, was to try to find where that leak was in that, that line that was installed in 2004. Um, this is what we found um, when, when we started to open it up. And you can see that the, the mineral insulation was pretty saturated. The, um, there, was, there was a significant amount of uh, deterioration on the outer jacket. Basically, it had failed. Um, the water had gone through the outer jacket, through the uh, steel, which had rotted away, which had corroded away into the mineral wool. And this is what, what we found. And basically, the moisture had gotten to a point that everything inside had failed. Laura, did you want to talk about again about water and what it does to the insulation? Yeah, I mean this this is a perfect example of the, of the situation that is occurring. And and on the next slide, um, it, it talks about the field applied joints. Every system has a risk factor. That's the way that I like to look at it. Human beings are putting in these systems. So when you're evaluating something, you want to ask yourself, what are the risk factors and what are the consequences of those risk factors? So in this particular situation, I know that Tom had mentioned it, that you know when, when they first were evaluating it, they thought that maybe some of the joints had been compromised and the insulation had gotten wet. When they went in to actually excavate out the system, they discovered that all the joints have been compromised. Once that water gets in, it's going to saturate that insulation. And even in a drainable, dryable system where they're going to blow the air through there and attempt to dry it, that insulation's integrity will never return again. You'll never achieve the uh, efficiency values of what the system was designed for. And depending, especially on a condensate system where it's a lot lower in temperature, uh, that insulation isn't necessarily going to completely dry out. And that moisture can be held up against that carrier pipe, and you can start to see the actual carrier pipe corrode. 
Um, so, you know, this is this is quite an extensive situation. The Army Corps does experience this in their own study. They discovered of all drainable drivable systems, they were looking at different manufacturers, that the average time span of determining there was moisture within their insulation system is less than four years. And I'll pass it back over to you, Tom. So, I mean, so, I, I guess at this point, I, I'd have to restate. So the, what we had planned to do, and this was a, and during the summer of 2019, we had planned, or 2018, we had planned a very simple, find where the leak was, open it up, dig down, open it up, and repair that leak. Um, we, we have done that in the past. Um, it's something that, that we're comfortable with doing. But all of a sudden, this when we saw that other, the, we just saw that other picture, uh, the previous picture, and it, and at that time we said, well, let's go a little bit further, and along the pipe, the length of the pipe, we started finding similar uh, similar problems as the pictures presented below show. Now I don't know how many work on college campuses or universities. Um, but we have a very short window um, when we can shut down steam to to areas of the campus. Typically, for us, is from graduate is from graduation until uh, a couple of weeks before students return, because we have RAs and freshmen coming back. So we have a very compressed period of time. So this is what we we found, and we kept we just kept we just kept digging. Unfortunately, this this we kept finding additional problems. As, as this is a another set of pictures what that what we had found, and what we went to our administration and and asked them to come out take a look at it, and we were charged with replacing the line in that summer. Um, there was no way at that point. There was no way they were going to allow us to put back similar pipe. And at that point, what we brought to the administration was um, the idea about using Gilslake, which we had not really used on campus before, but we felt that it, it gave us a because it was um, readily available. Um, in fact, we just ordered some Gilslake on one of the um, projects that we're working on. We ordered it, and within believe it or not through the state purchasing process we were able to get it from the time we ordered it to the time it was on our dock was one week um and and when we had this we were actually closing down a segment of our campus one of the roads on our campus not a major road but a secondary road we were also uh um detouring the emergency room exit from our UHS, our university health system. We had to change the transportation problems around the pedestrian. It's very, this area of the campus is a, a part of the campus that gets many tours um, of prospective students, especially in the summertime. We had to get this all done and, and the campus said, go ahead and, and do this. So no one, no one on ours had ever, had, had ever worked with Gil Slate before besides talking to them. Uh, Gilslate had, uh, we, we contacted Gilslate, we got a contractor, we utilized our, our uh, uh, welding contract here on campus, and what Gilslate did, and, and maybe Laura can talk about that, is, is how they design a system and get it back to us in a timely fashion, and, sure. and, and not only but the support that's offered when the job is ongoing. You bet. Sure, I'll take it from here. So Gilsolate can be used in a lot of different ways. As I said, the, the configuration and ability of it is flexible. Um, there's options that you have. Uh, what I like to call a band-aid is where, let's say your steam line goes down in the middle of the night and you need to get heat to the students. Um, you know, you can go in and do a five foot repair with our material and interface it with whatever your existing system is. That's called a Band-Aid. Now, in looking at the large scheme of things, 
the the issue if if that band-aid repair was related to corrosion and let's say hypothetically that run is we'll say 200 feet when you remove that corrosion aspect out of that run it's actually going to cause an acceleration of other areas that are compromised by corrosion so the the situation is you're going to be putting a shovel back to the ground to keep repairing the run and so what we recommend to, to clients and, and umass included is that if you can do a run from a vault to a vault a building to a vault something of that set section that that's the best way to do it because now you're going to know that the integrity of that entire run has been fixed but in some circumstances like i said in the middle of the night if you got a line that's gone down and you need to get it up and running, by all means, hey, that's that's the quick and easy uh, situation. Our material um, is field applied. So they put the pipe in and then we pour our material around it. Our spacing and thicknesses are dictated by the diameter of the pipe and the temperature of the pipe. Now, what UMass did with this particular um, project is we normally can space our pipes much closer together so that's going to reduce the amount of excavation that's going to be associated with the run as well as um you know the number of, of replacement of hardscape landscape etc above the run um since they were going into existing buildings and vaults and it was the drainable dryable system the pipe was spaced already uh, 12 inches apart and so they went ahead and, and stuck with, with that spacing for this particular project. We're filling a hole. Um, and, and what Tom had indicated was that their engineer was still kind of working on the um, design of it and running the stress analysis, but the university had the pipe on site. They figured, hey, we got so many feet of straight run pipe. We have this many elbows. We estimate we're going to need this much gill slate. So they had the pipe and the gill slate actually on campus before the engineer had completed all of their um, calculations. And they essentially utilized the same trench that um, it was the perma pipe was in. And, and so we work with the engineer. We have CAD details and design and installation manual. Those details are essentially the same details that existed 40 years ago. I mean, when they invented Link Seal, we incorporated that into our details. Um, and so we worked with the engineering firm um, that UMass was working with for all of those details and, and reviewed their drawings. Um, as Tom mentioned, it was a new contractor installing it as well. Um, we went out there and supported the contractor um, with the installation. We see all different types of folks put it in, um, from insulators to mechanicals, uh, university folks. For example, I know that on projects that are as, uh, as $4 million or less, Texas A&M's own uh, utility staff are able to install the gilsolate on those projects. So, um, you know, it could be essentially almost anybody. It's, it's understanding, as I said, the risk factors initially, is understanding what the risk factors are associated with gill slate and then addressing that. Um, it's basic construction. Uh, that's one of the other benefits with regards to it. So we supported um, the contractor with the whole installation. Um, by the end of the summer, it's my understanding that UMass will have uh, seven gill slate systems uh, in place. And now they've gotten to the point where they understand it, that they feel confident about self-performing smaller projects um, and, and, and moving forward, enabling them to really, you know, punch these projects out. Like Tom mentioned, his window for um, construction and digging up the campus is very small. So we're able to help them with regards to that. And then I'm going to let you jump back in here, Tom, about your IRs. So, 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 in in, in addition, um, what what we did is is the con the, the contractor the contractor had no experience at all um, with the with the gill slate, and there was there was concerns about um, how it goes in, how because you're only using a concrete vibrator to compact your material. Uh, well, how much, how often, where, how, and, and the, the contractor, which was a, 
which was basically an excavation contractor and who had laborers had had a lot of a lot of questions. Gilslake was there, they answered the questions. Um and 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 there was there's little things like you can buy you can buy Gilslate in a uh a, a large bag that takes uh, 60 cubic feet or you can buy buy it in bags um small bags 40 pound bags and you can go bag by bag of course the large on the screen the large large bags are a lot easier um and to handle when you're doing a uh, large amounts uh, but there's a trick and and usually what happens if uh by doing by by the more you do, you you learn certain tricks about getting they call it the, uh, the elephant pump to get get the just like coming up with the elephant. But basically, we we were able not only to, to get it um, complete, but we we had a couple weeks to spare. Um, again, working on a college campus, there's a lot of people um, will come up to the fence, and they a lot of people have opinions, and we were. We were given a very um, hard time about the um, that we were we were we were returning pipe without insulation that that we are losing all all the insulation value we are no longer have it insulated we we were we weren't thinking about our environment and we and we kept telling people no it's there but what we did on the right hand side that fall time. And we usually try to go just before we wait till the trees um, have shed their shed their leaves. So it's usually around February, I mean uh, December. Uh, we have a guy comes up in a helicopter, and he hangs out the helicopter and he takes infrared pictures of our of our campus. And one of the the points that we wanted to do was this um, line that we have had put in, and you can see on the on the top right hand picture. That that is where that 225 feet went in. Um, there there is no heat sec signature. And when you ask about how how um, accurate those numbers are, if you look to the right of the picture, uh, uh, elevated temperature, kind of like a, a, a bright orange color past the manhole. Well, that is just simply a condensate leak, um, and and that in a actually in a utilidor so there's it's under four feet of ground it's under four feet of uh soil uh concrete six inch eight inches of concrete and it's it's that sensitive that you're able to see that small leak just um and that was something that, that we'll get to we were able to go and fix a, a few years later but as can be seen our heat loss there was no no longer exist, and we did, we did not have heat loss coming. Since since then, Laura Laura is is right. We have used Gilslate. Our our people do install do the installations now. We for the most part on on the smaller jobs, we're like the University of Texas Austin. We kind of do our own installations. Matter of fact, we have just we we per, our crew our utility crew is working on on four right this summer we already put one into our curry hicks cage um and which is we, we put a new theme and on state service um, for thirty six thousand um, dollars and or they help us out with that correct putting gill slate under concrete which is something that they haven't seen a lot of but they gave us some suggestions and we passed it by our engineering folks and they said that was fun. uh so we took some as as can be seen this is uh, another IR of the uh, the Gill Slate insulation, and we do not have any heat uh, being generated in that area. Right. I mean, Gill Slate is inner inorganic minerals. They've reached their lowest level of decomposition, so you're not going to see a change in efficiency of the material over a period of time that can occur with other insulations that they actually lose um, some of their values as time goes on. And so this repeat IR of that very first system that they put in works as just a, a reinforcement for the campus that you know the, the gill slate is continuing to perform excellent for the campus and you know that they're very happy 
with with this and you know as i go back to the the comment about you know everybody looking to carbon neutrality and, and improving efficiencies throughout the campus i mean one of the meetings that tom uh requested that i have there on campus was with their chancellor um you know because you know they're they're having a significant effect with regards to money and efficiency and you know it went straight up the the ladder if you will um as to the significance and importance that actually their direct buried systems are i like to say you can't screw in enough light bulbs to offset the cost of energy losses due to damaged insulation systems i agree, I agree. so so in, in on the front on the on the right is a, a system that we uh installed ourselves this was going this was a failed system going into the clark house and on the on the bottom right is the the clark greenhouses you can you can see but inside that area we our our crew totally installed a new gill slate system um we we took a, a route go from point a to point not because of expansion but there's a uh important uh our campus is uh, our, but we have some very uh, and there's a uh, between point A and point B special so we have a uh, a circular route around it. But our to uh, put the line in, uh, we needed to uh, get that done and in a best time time. And if we had if we had uh, tried to use any other method. I'm not sure we would have met our, our date because some, a lot of time when you're buying a different system, you're looking at six, six, seven, eight weeks for it to work. Um, with the slate, we had, we had to get slate very quickly. Uh, we got to look at the pipe quickly. Uh, eyes are elders, a little well. Um, and, and that's one picture of a, another system that we've installed that worked out. I was just going to add, you know, with regards to the availability of the gill slate, that that is something different from other systems. As I said, there's 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 nothing to fabricate. So as with the first project, they had the pipe and the gill slate on campus before the engineering was done. We manufacture gill slate in three locations in California, Illinois, as well as Georgia. And um, right now we're doing a hot water conversion for um, uh, uh, Overland College in Ohio. Um, it's about a mile of trench. They're going to be putting in that conversion this summer. Uh, it will take about 36,000 cubic feet. And we have all that material in our Illinois facility ready to ship to campus. Um, as Tom explained, they're, they're doing the installation them themselves on these smaller projects. His projects are taking about anywhere from 600 cubic feet to maybe like 2,000 cubic feet. So, you know, we have the material ready to ship right away. So if you have any projects that need to be done this summer, we can we can supply you that material and get it done. And and certainly, as, as Tom has indicated, you know, their own utility staff are installing it. We are happy to work with with your campus and your staff if you want to install it yourself or work with the contractors um, as well but certainly um, we're able we're able to solve that problem immediately especially during the summertime as tom said they're trying to to push out as many projects that they can before the full uh, student population returns back to campus now if you wanted to add anything else there tom I, I and again for us for, it, it's important it's it, it's important that we get the job uh, just just for instance on, on that on that uh, uh, project two hundred and twenty-five we had been we were looking at pricing of from one million to one point two five million dollars job from from our uh uh the uh engineer that that has done the original plan for us. He ended up spending six hundred twenty-three thousand um, dollars on the project. So it was a significant savings for us. And not only were we able to put it in for that price, but why we were doing it because we were able to put a subtrain in as well. Uh, so we 
also have some drainage that will help in that area. And I guess one one of the things that that was important that we missed sometimes is that by 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 the job ourselves we had much uh, quality control, but we were we were there the entire time, and we were able to make real time changes as as the project was was advancing. And and as anybody knows, when there, there's advantages to being able to make a real time decision to keep a project from and 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 it and it really helped us out. We, we have we had questions ourselves. The university had questions itself about the topic. We we we've actually talked to other um, facilities that you feel so like and and Laura Laura and so like so highly will not take giving up the names of, of people that can help or ask questions. But we have uh Actually, about the penetration going to the building, and um, we we're able to come up with a uh, work to come up with a very good, very very nice way to come into a building, a safe way to come into a building. We also looked at us seeing guys it's really concerned whenever uh, you put pipe in the ground. So we 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 upped our our uh, our spacing of of. The supports um, to to follow ASM. So we have meters. Uh, yep, we 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 use a different material for uh, coating of the steel uh, and the concrete, but something that's worked well for the project. But you can you can design, you can take, you can you can put in your own just like we now have a charge. Of Personality. So we we put the numbers that we have are appropriate into those points instead of depending on something else for those numbers. So so there, there's a lot of advantages to being able to do more yourself. Yeah. And I guess now um, we're to the question spot. I don't know if you want to explain, Billy, on where they enter in any questions that they might have for us to answer. Yes. We have several questions to get started with. Uh, first question is, what methods were used to assess the condition of the steam and condensate network? That, that was basically what we did is, is it was a combination of, of the experience of our crews and the infrared analysis. And we actually did a wide assessment of, of actually the manholes identified what was in the manholes. Um, the the where the the looking for um, areas of concern. And, and again, for us, we saw we saw um, no return at all. A lot of times, our content, all of a sudden, we we thought we find we're getting get dropped in our content, or back on our. Content. We also one of the things that we do in our condensate we in our scene that we send out we send out an Amy and we've been doing that now for almost 20 years. So our condensate piping, this our life expectancy has been on up a lot. We that. Um, but for the but looking for the condensate return, which tells us if we uh, have a problem with our condensate, and also uh, looking with the infrared is a great great uh, uh, tool for helping us identify areas that, that we're losing our insulation. Okay, thank you. Our next question, in your experience, what is the rough order of magnitude for the shallow trench you mentioned? Um, I'm not sure I quite understand that. The, the, uh, could we expand that a little bit? I'll ask that he type more into the chat box and we'll get, so we'll move on to the next question. Okay. Curious to know what the condensate makeup percentage went up to when the steam pressure was increased. Ah, we, we went from uh, zero return to 100% from that area. We, it, it was, it was uh, a remarkable and, and, and basically over the, over the years, um, we had been dumping the condensate 
and, and because we were getting in inside inside the building we would be getting calls in the middle of the night because of severe banging water hammer the water hammer would be happening and the only way we could stop the water hammer was by opening up drain by opening up drains and dumping the condensate um but when when we took a, a real close look at, at steam pressure at our steam pressure versus what we had for for a head to get up for actual height of we we went to look at the u.s uh uh yes mapping and and we found that we we kind of went to a high point in our condensate system and when you did some pretty basic physics calculations it says well there was no way we were going to get up over that that hump so um now now change changing changing pressures was was a pretty complicated thing because where we were in our, our we had to change diaphragms and prvs uh our trap sizes we had to we ended up changing all of our traps i mean it, it was a significant undertaking because that that was an entire the, the only good thing about covid if there is anything good is that we had no one in the south our southwest residential which is typically full of uh camps during the summertime so we we were able to do all this work during the sum, the first summer of covid uh and i don't really think if if it if if it hadn't been COVID, we probably wouldn't have had it all completed in one summer. But by by putting those new traps, new uh, rebuilding our PRVs, you know, changing diaphragms, and there, there was a lot of work involved. But we 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 went from zero to 100 percent, which was our our CHP people, our, our heating plant people, are really happy. Let's put it that way. Okay, thank you. Next question. Can you help us understand what happens when you have groundwater and flowing water underground with the hydrophobic insulation material? We saw the video showing water being contained by the isolation material. Does water flow around the underground piping or does insulation material wash away? Okay, that's a great question. So in looking at water, there's two circumstances that you need to take a look at. There's water, like groundwater in the soil, like a rising and falling water table or um, you know, water pressure pushing onto it. A perfect example of the hydrostatic head of water pressure is um, in downtown Houston, the supplier of all the steam condensate and pump condensate to the hospital there, which is the world's largest medical center, um, has been using gilsolate on all of that piping for the last 34 years. Um, they haven't had to replace a system, but they're 18 feet in the ground. So they're essentially at sea level. And a few years ago when they had Hurricane Harvey come through, you know, there were parts of Houston that had at least 10 feet of water. So what the Gilslate envelopes are seeing in that circumstance, which would be a real world hydrostatic head of water pressure of 28 feet, that's 18 feet in the ground and 10 feet of water at grade. Essentially, that pressure pushing down on the gilsolate. Now, with regards to flowing water, okay, that is a different scenario. And with regards to the gilsolate, if you were to envision taking a hose on full blast and uh, sand, it would erode the sand away. The same circumstance would happen with the gilsolate. Now, there are ways to mitigate that. As, as Tom had mentioned, they put in a subdrain so that they could take away any water, uh, flowing water that might come in proximity to the envelope. Um, I like to say that there's a la carte op options with Gilslate. They were also wrapping uh, the Gilslate envelope in a geotextile fabric, which was essentially putting that fabric down in the trench before they poured the Gilslate. And then they um, took the fabric and kind of laid it over the sides. And once the Gilslate was compacted, they folded that back over the top like a burrito, essentially trying to contain um, the integrity of that envelope. So if there is flow, a positive flow, like a hose on, on sand in proximity to the gill slate, we need to address it. And there's different methods to address that positive water flow. But with regards to 
just moisture content in the soil, saturated soils, rising, falling water tables, um, you know, the gill slate can withstand that. That's a combination between the hydrophobic nature of it and then also the particle engineering behind the material. As Tom said, we vibrate the material. When that occurs, I like to liken it to putting a puzzle together. When you put the puzzles together, those, those pieces interlock. When we mechanically compact the gill slate, those multi-sized, multi-faceted particles interlock with one another. And that's what's going to resist the hydrostatic head of water pressure and also um, you know, keep, keep, give that, that load bearing property, the 12,000 pounds per square foot. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Our next question, is there anything in gill slate that is harmful? Any okay. concern when friable? Sure. So gill slate's considered a nuisance dust, man. I'd say we were vogue before it was vogue. Um, what we require for um, the contractors installing the gill slate is to wear an N95 mask. Now, they can wear other um, protection gear. Um, I know in the photographs um, of the crews there doing the first install, they had Tyvek suits. That's an option. That's just to keep their clothes clean. Um, typically, it's just jeans, and you can use an air compressor to blow off any gill slate. They can wear uh, gloves and goggles, but um, the, uh, the only protection that we say that should be worn is an N95 mask. And I'll show you here. I have some gill slate in this little jar, okay, and I will do this for you. So, um, you know, it's like I said, inner inorganic. There's nothing dangerous with regards to the gill slate. Uh, Lauren, if I could just uh, to expand on that a little bit, our 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 uh, EHNS Environmental Health and Safety, uh, they came over while we were doing that because it, it was something new. Their their biggest concern. Uh, was dust and way the way you the way you uh, um, and if you are pouring the gill slate from a high high altitude or high height um, and let it free fall it will get dusty but what the contractors the people installing it will learn is simply by keeping the elephant trunk in the in the gill slate and and doing it um, so it's covered up they usually are able to get that down pretty well so you you don't start uh, uh, a dust cloud forming, and 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 it, and it took the guys about a day to to master that technique. But once they did, um, to, the same crew have worked on another very large project with us. And when they got on that second project, they 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 beat their installation time by days because their guys, including their excavator operator, had had been had done it before. So that that's what we did the, was a dust, and and but if you can eliminate the dust by just staying down, yeah. Yeah, you want you want to get the gill slate down as close to the pipes as possible. Like I said, the large bag that I have pulled up here right now has a four foot elephant trunk. So if they're dragging that trunk along the top of the pipe, that's going to minimize dust. But if the crane operator hoisted that bag up and that trunk is six feet from the uh, top of the pipes and start shaking that bag, yes, it's going to create dust because of that free fall. So the objective is to get the gill slate as close to the pipes as possible when um, when they're pouring it into the trench, and that will minimize the dust. Okay, it looks like we have time for one more question. Any questions that we did not get to, uh, either Laura or Tom will reach out to you individually with an answer. So our final question is, how is the gill slate contained around the pipe, and what keeps it from running in all directions the first time it rains? Exactly. Okay, so as you can kind of see in this image that we have pulled up here, um, there's forms there. We're, we're filling a hole, and what we say is that you can use a drywall or gypsum board as those forms. The purpose is to create a space in which to pour the gill slate. Are forms required? The answer is no. For example, if your horizontal width of your trench needed to be 22 inches and you have an excavator that says hey i got a 24 inch bucket can i just dig a 24 inch wide trench and the answer is yes um, if they're going to not form it that extra two inches is going to be some extra gill slate and that's where they're going to look at that cost matrix of what's 
what's most effective for them. Is it easier to just have a, a, a two inch wider trench and use a little more gilsolate, or is it better to, to put up the forming? And every, every underground application is a little bit different. And so, you know, again, as I said, there's kind of this a la carte. The only place that you would have to form is if your ditch wall is not stable. I mean, we do work down in Louisiana, their soils like gumbo soup. Um, so in, in that circumstance, they have to form. The type of forming material, again, we see all different kinds. Um, in some circumstances, they're wood. Obviously, in the United States right now, the cost of wood is extremely expensive. And you know, maybe that wouldn't be the, the best choice to, to utilize that. Um, once the gill slate is compacted, it, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. It's going to stay there um, in there. And those forms stay in the ground as well. You just, they just kind of you know, stay in there. The purpose is, again, to just create that space to install gill slate and get those dimensions that we're looking for. OK. Well, we're at the top of the hour, and I would want to close out here and just to say to Laura and Tom, thank you so much for taking time to do this presentation for us. And to our attendees, thank you for taking time today to be with us. Although we didn't get through all of the questions, your questions will be answered. So until next time, be safe, stay healthy, and have a great week. Thank you so much for attending. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody.